actually been allowed, invited in, to do a lecture in the school there. It could be a risky yeah. venture for me, but I'm not sure. At about two o'clock, this guy's knocked on the door and said, uh, do you know a class that we can come and film and have a Q&A &A session with? He's a YouTuber, um, Joey Carbstrong, vegan activist, animal rights activist. And I thought, well, what can I do with this? It's a good topic of discussion. Everyone's like, they love it. You should keep it rolling. What can I do with this? And then I thought, well, the last lecture we had was about animals, reason, and a whole range of things like that. So I thought, let's take the learning opportunity here of having a further discussion of the relationship between reason, ethics, and animals. And uh, yeah, here's this guy to help us do this. And the, the question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Why should the law refuse its protection to any sensitive being? Okay, so I, I, I want to use that to frame what's going to happen now. Now, um, what we're going to do, or what, what Joey wants to do, is to, I think, introduce himself, and then he'd like to show um, a, a brief uh, piece of vision. Now, um, as in the previous lectures, I have to give a trigger warning here. Um, the images in this uh, video will be um, particularly disturbing. Um, so if you're disturbed by not only the idea of cruelty towards animals, but the actual cruelty that they might undergo um, if they, uh, in, in an abattoir, for example, um, then either you're going to have to avert your eyes, block your ears, or actually get out of here. Now, I understand that if you want to leave, um, that's not going to necessarily be a product of your um, ethical position as much as um, the fact that it is a pretty horrible thing to confront. And I think even um, those people that um, may be committed to um, meat eating and stuff like that will accept that how we get our food can be a pretty brutal process. So I give you that trigger warning in advance. There's no shame to leave or you can block your ears or whatever. And then um, what we're going to do is we're going to go into a Q&A session. Now I want you to remember that, um, that um, we're doing reason here. So let's hear some good arguments, some good ethical positions. Um, let's back it up with what we've uh, kind of learned in this particular subject. And, and when we're discussing these things, let's discuss it in a respectful way as well, remembering uh, what I suppose should be the Melbourne way. So I haven't always been a vegan, okay? And when you hear that word, you might think a vegan, they eat lettuce and tofu, they're pale and they're weak and they're annoying or something like that. That might, might be what you think. Now, I actually... I come from a past of a pretty hard past. I was involved with gangs and, and going down a pretty rough route. And part of my sort of awakening was sobriety and veganism. Why would someone who used to be involved with such a hectic lifestyle um, find veganism? Well, I understood something. I understood that it was an issue of justice. Okay. Now I had a, an issue, I took issue with seeing the innocent and the vulnerable be victimized for a sort of a trivial reason, which, you know, for, for me, my taste preference was a trivial reason, and it, I didn't see the justification in sort of exploiting and enslaving these beings, defenseless beings, for my own pleasure. So that was a part of my transformation, and I also had some realizations about health. Okay, heart disease is the number one killer on Earth. Saturated fat, cholesterol. Cholesterol is only found in animal products, builds up in our arteries over time, and it's killing people en masse. 17 million people a year. Kills more people than wars and cancer combined. And all of these things come together, and which is why I adhere to the ethical side of this, and I also try to teach people about it. Because for me, I don't think people who aren't vegan are bad people at all. We've just been conditioned by society to do something that contributes to harm to animals. Now, who here thinks animals deserve moral consider consideration? S 
That's what I'm talking about. Most people here believe animals have moral value. Anyone here believe animals aren't sentient? Meaning they, they, they don't have their own subjective experience. They value their lives, yeah? Do we all agree that they value their families? They don't want to die. We can, can we all agree that they don't want to die? Okay, so we have common ground here. You share the same beliefs I do. You do. But the only difference is I have aligned my actions with that belief. Okay? I've chosen to live a lifestyle which is aligned with my belief that animals deserve moral consideration, moral treatment. So I choose not to participate and fund the industries that cause them harm, that take their lives from them, that separate their families and that enslave them. So I want to show you all a video and what I'm about to show you didn't happen in Zimbabwe in the 1980s. Okay, this happens in Australia in the last couple of years. This is current footage, local. These abattoirs are all around Melbourne, all around Australia. Okay, just out in the outskirts of Victoria mainly. But we'll show you the video and if it makes you feel uncomfortable, it's totally fine. But you have to ask yourself, are we natural meat eaters? If watching how our food is produced makes us feel sick to our stomach, how can we claim to be natural carnivores, like lions, like lions are? Okay, I want you to ask yourself that question, and if you feel the need to turn away, I would uh, also ask yourself the question, if it's not good enough to look at, how is it good enough to consume and put in your body? I am the I, I completely understand how you're feeling right now. I've seen hundreds of hours of this footage. I've been out the front of gas chambers where they're lowering pigs into carbon dioxide gas, which is what, what you've seen in that footage. Hearing their screams for mercy, and it never gets easier. It never gets easier. Now I see a classroom full of compassionate human beings. That's what I see. We are taught to do something to animals that if we've seen the process, we would not want to be involved with. And this is what I try to help people make the connection. You know, we are all logical, rational, compassionate human beings. We don't want to see this. It's obvious. This makes any normal human being feel uncomfortable, disgusted. Did it make anyone feel hungry, though? Exactly. Now, how have they so cleverly tricked us to believe that this violence, this product of fear, do you see those animals trying to escape? How have they cleverly tricked us to believe that this is food? Magic trick. Okay. Yes, brother. Okay. I'm suggesting that your natural instincts when you watched that was to probably help those animals. Did you feel compelled to eat them? But it's, I mean, Obviously not, because we've never seen that, but okay. I'm just saying that hmm. when we were less urbanised and more connected to nature, yeah. we wouldn't be as disturbed by the death of animals because we had to kill them to eat. Uh, I would argue that. I would argue that. I would say that you can become conditioned to violence. But initially, it, I don't feel that we are killers. Now, there are things you do to survive, okay? And when survival comes into it, you know, you have more of a a reason to kill. I mean, I'm, I, I personally wouldn't kill to survive, but I can understand in the past why they did that. Now, I would still argue that a human being innately does not have killer instincts. Yeah, but I mean, before, like, it was the iron and red meat that really, if you believe in that tradition, it was the stuff like the iron and red meat that gave you strength to lift your knuckles off the ground. I, I would disagree with that. I would say that cooking food and uh, when we started to cook carbohydrates predominantly gave us more glucose. Uh, the brain is functioning fuel on glucose, yeah? Um, but but let's, just say we, let's just say it was natural. Now, would we look to nature to determine our ethics? Would we say because something is nat natural, something happens in nature, that that therefore makes it moral? Because there are things that happen in nature that are immoral, aren't they? No, like, just, yeah. Because you said at the start that we weren't like lions, but really, yeah. originally we were like lions, but we weren't I, I'd say, I'd suggest that we did what we had to do in a survival situation. And I, I wouldn't say that we would, like, 
If you had uh, some a carnivore, they have an instinct. If a rabbit runs past a carnivore, their instinct is there to chase and attack the, the rabbit. But you have a human being, let's just say they haven't been conditioned at all, use their instincts. The rabbit runs past. What does a baby or child want to do with a rabbit? They don't want to chase them, rip the rabbit to shreds. I would, I would argue that we don't have that killer instinct as well. And we proved it when we see, if I showed a true carnivore these images, they would think, oh, a hurt, limping animal. I'm going to eat that corpse. Human beings know we season our food, we are detached from the process, and which is, this is why we consume the animal products, I believe. But I think there's a difference between the meat industry now and hunting. Yeah, and hunting and yeah, I think it's worth pointing out as well that um, gathering and hunting societies, we've reversed the hunter gatherer term to gathering and hunting because gathering was such an important part of the process. So, you know, the human diet, when uh, you're talking about those kind of societies um, was a very, very mixed diet and the hunting actually only came partly into it. I think the argument about the, um, what is natural, um, I think this issue about, well, if we replicated nature, then we go down this kind of hideous social Darwinian path of the survival of the fittest and we can end up in some very, very unpleasant places. Um, Clearly, people like Hume felt that we could transcend aspects mm. of our nature. That we would, uh, for example, you know, it was in the nature of the lion to, uh, to kill, but not necessarily within our nature. And both natures were fine. Uh, and I think as well that we can see human nature um, is transformed over time in terms of its ethical predispositions to the world. I think we should... Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll move on, yeah, yeah definitely. So, um, I think there's... Yeah, can we... Can you give a definition of what you're proposing that we act like of veganism? So, okay. you know, what, where uh, we draw the line in terms of like reducing suffering as much as possible? Yeah. Uh, uh, people often have a misconception that a vegan lifestyle means you eliminate all harm altogether, and that would be impossible. Just by existing, you are going to cause some harm. Okay? You know, just civilization causes harm. You know, building. Uh, civilization on wildlife and things like that but that, that doesn't mean we should cause the maximum amount of harm and there's practical things we can do to avoid the most of this, this suffering the meat dairy egg industries the skin of animals testing products on their faces uh, buying vegan products where you can reduces harm as far as practically possible now I understand that society is built off the backs of animals you go into that wallpaper there's probably some minute animal products in there. We're just saying we can, most of society can choose vegan options. I mean, it's not a hard thing to do. We can't, you know, extradite ourselves out of, out of society and live in the jungle. Even then, you're probably going to step on an ant. So it's, it's about practicality. Um, so the vast majority of people who live in the global south who don't have education yeah. surrounding veganism, who perhaps are unable to make that choice, it constitutes an unnecessary value judgment on things that may necessarily be like an important part of their culture. Like my mother comes from an indigenous culture, mm -hmm. and it's like an important part of their culture that they ritualize like the killing of that animal and they like, treat it respectfully and like they hate it. Like okay. that constitutes value judgment on that. And when they can't make that choice to like have a vegan thing or like to do yeah. that because of their circumstances, yeah. it tells those people that they are necessarily worthless than other people who can because you come from a place of privilege. Hmm. I would, I, would, I would contest that. I would say that animal products are for privileged people. Uh, you know, grains and rice and vegetables and things like that. They're, they're the cheapest foods on the planet, easily accessible, beans and legumes and breads. But if we were to use, let's just use culture to determine our morality for a sec. There's things that are cultural you know, that are culturally, that were culturally acceptable, that we would never say are moral. So I don't think, I personally would ask you, do you think culture dictates morality? Yeah, I, well, I think that it like, can do, and that, like, that may not necessarily be a bad thing in all cases, because it has proven to be, like, in the past. Like, I, I think that, like, it comes yeah, on a case-by-case -case basis. You can't necessarily say that, like, facing all morality on culture is necessarily bad. I would suggest it creates contradictions to say that culture, because something's cultural, therefore it makes it moral, or it, it makes it moral to take the life of an animal when it's not necessary for your survival, 
and to use culture to justify that, I, I'd say it, it, it isn't a justification, but I'm open to debate for sure. Um, Kev, before we move on yeah. to another question, there's one that kind yeah. of arises out of the question yeah. here that's a, a, a bit of an extension of that. Now, um, we all know what happened in the Second World War yeah. um, with the mass genocides and stuff like that. Well, one of the things that um, were, came to light was the kind of appalling experimentation that had been going on uh, upon human beings. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it went beyond the extermination camp. These were experiments that, uh, in effect, put people to death in the name of medical science. Uh, and at the end of the war, they thought, right, what can we do about this? And they had a Nuremberg trial, especially for the doctors. And in, in the process, they hacked out the ethical code that we live with today. Yeah. Now, part of that ethical code is that if you are developing, say, a drug, you've got to test it on animals. Now, now, how do we square the kind of um, the um, the way that we we have uh, built up an ethical system around developing um, medical drugs with the the moral stance um, um, that says that we shouldn't be exploiting mm. animals in that way? Because there is a, a, a mass conflict. There is. We're going to sa there save is. human suffering by putting animals to suffer. So, so how do we do I, I would suggest that what you just saw there, meat, dairy and eggs, completely not a grey area. We can easily avoid those. And when we talk about medical testing, um, I, I personally would say that those animals are not consenting. So we are doing it against their will. And also, I don't know how reliable medical study, studies done on different species are to us. That, I mean, there's conflicting data. That is a very serious issue. Yeah. Mouse to human model is a Mouse bit to human. Uh, we can have consenting humans. There are alternatives. But the thing is, we don't exercise, we don't even entertain those alternatives. First thing, use an animal. Oh, a pest, kill them all. Uh, our, our first, this is our first um, thing we reach for animals and they are not consenting subjects so if someone couldn't give consent a human being maybe they had some mental disability they could not give consent would that justify you know using them for medical testing we might say oh they're not as sentient as us animals aren't as intelligent as us you know we gotta we gotta find a moral justification um so i think i'll come back to you right? but um, maybe we'll take uh, one at the back there uh, you've had your hand up a long time uh, <laughs> Um, I agree. I was vegan for two years, okay. and then my eating disorder got in the way because okay. the um, way you restrict your diet when vegan options aren't necessarily as readily available okay. as they can be is very similar to how you can do it when you have an eating disorder. And I think it's unfair to demand that of someone. Um, I think the way the vegan movement projects this, you cannot eat meat, is very harmful when okay. you can be vegan one, one day of the week or six days of the week, you would be making a difference and mm. it would not be as triggering yeah. or to do what you can. You know, yeah. Rather than you have, you know, if you can touch an egg, yeah. Do you, do you yeah, I totally understand. First of all, I want to say so, I'm sorry that you've suffered from an eating disorder. It can be very, um, it's, there's a lot of suffering involved. I, a lot of um, psychological trauma you can go through with that. Totally understand that. Um, vegan options are pretty re readily available now. Every su supermarket now you can find vegan stuff. It, nearly every fast food store can be veganized, pizza, vegetarian with no cheese, burritos without the meat and the cheese, you can add beans, add guacamole. Um, if you know what to do, if you had coaching, had some guidance, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure we could, should blame the eating disorder on the veganism and maybe, and, and animals would have to go to the slaughterhouse because of that. And I would suggest if you'd say reducing um, your meat consumption, I always ask this question, what is a acceptable number of animals to go to the slaughterhouse on our behalf if we just thought we'd just not eat animals you know once a day or go vegan um, you know one day of the week then all these other animals are literally suffering dying losing their life you know and for me that for me 
like what happens to them is makes everything else seem, you know, it pales in comparison, I feel. But not saying that your struggles are, not belittling your struggles at all, but... Psychologically, yeah. that's not how you, you change. Like, if you want to yeah. start going to the gym, yeah. um, you need to set yourself realistic goals. Yeah. And if you think that going completely vegan is not an option for you in this moment, yeah. then you need to set yourself an achievable goal. Like, today, I'm not going to eat Whereas if you say, I'm a vegan and a new UK, you're going to feel bad about yourself and just people mm. tend to give up psychologically. And I believe that that's a huge problem because that is why a lot of people yeah, I see it a lot. I see it a lot. That's why I actually offer. A, I, I do it. We've got a program called Challenge Twenty Two, which offers mentors. So we do it as a community. So we're, people have the support. And I've seen people try to do this by themselves, and they're like, "Well, what do I do? What do I eat? Where do I go?" You know, and they make mistakes. That's why we offer support with Challenge Twenty Two, because to, because of that exact uh, thing, that exact problem, which does arise. And you're completely right. You've had your hand up and down a lot over the last 15 uh, 20 minutes, so I reckon you get a go, and then I think we'll go there and then back to you, okay? So it's kind of digressing a little yeah. bit, but still on the same sort of subject. Like you're saying about lots of, you know, grains and things that are really cheap, but, you know, a lot of those products might be imported from a country where the people harvesting them are not treated well. So, like, where do you, where, what's your stance on the treatment of human in the production of food that is vegan friendly? Okay, that's a very, very good question. The way I would answer that is, when you buy grains, you don't 100% know that a human has been harmed or exploited or enslaved in the process of that food. You could probably check, you could probably buy fair trade food. When you buy animal products, you can 100% guarantee someone was chopped up into pieces against their will. You can guarantee their children were stolen from them, they were forcibly bred. You can guarantee these things. Now, slaughterhouse workers, do you think someone grows up as a child and, and decides, I want to work in a slaughterhouse where it smells like feces and blood and I'm killing innocent animals all day? No, they don't. And they so suffer PTSD, they have horrific working conditions, and when we pay for these products, okay, we are putting these people in horrific work conditions. So that's a human rights violation as well. And we can guarantee that. We can, we can guarantee when you buy animal products, they're coming from these horrific places. That's a guarantee. When you buy rice, oh, you know, we, 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 we live in a, in a world where it's really hard to completely avoid any harm, but you can try your best. So by that argument, yeah. if, like, say, you know, a family friend of yours had a farm, you know, a couple of chickens and they made some eggs, would yeah. you those eggs knowing that the chickens were still alive and well and that they had naturally laid those eggs because you know that the animals Suffering. Yeah, that's an interesting one. This debate, the I have backyard hens in my backyard, they drop some eggs, is it okay to eat them? I would ask that individual if they are vegan in all other facets of their life. Because if you're still consuming bacon from gas chambered pigs, if you're cons still consuming dairy from slaughtered cows, um, so if you're completely, if you're vegan, you're not engaging in animal exploitation. I'll tell you something about the backyard egg industry. So those hens come from hatcheries. The hatcheries mince, did you see those chicks being minced up alive, by the way? They're those chicks and they went through that thing. That's called a macerator. They were males, they cannot lay eggs, okay? If those hens come from a hatchery, you're supporting the, the industry that minces up male chicks. Also, no, no that's not true at all. No? Um, I so, so you bred, bred your own? Yeah. Okay, so if you bred your own, but a lot of the time they get, they're getting, a lot of the time backyard hens are coming from hatcheries. I don't know about that. A lot of the time they are. But let's just say you rescue the hen. Yeah. Yeah, so is she vegan? Well, she doesn't kill the chickens. Yeah, but, but like this is, what, this is the debate that I have with someone who doesn't con contribute to what we've just seen, and they're saying, I re let's just say I rescued some chickens, right? They, lay, they dropped some eggs on the floor. Well, it's no, no harm me eating those eggs. I rescued these chickens from a factory farm. I've given them a better life, right? I would still suggest that we are viewing a chicken as a resource, okay? We are viewing them as a product. And this is where this whole exploitation mentality comes from. We are saying, the only reason I want chickens is because they provide me with a product. 
This is where it all began. We're viewing animals as products. Do you see what I mean? Is it? Um, but before we move on, yeah. I, I want to just ask, like, nobody, re I mean, you've done it a bit, a, a bit's coming in here, but the, yeah. there's not been any real defense here of human exceptionalism. You know, people going into bat for humans and say, yeah, we're superior, you're wrong, because actually these animals are a piece of technology, which you could construct them as a piece of technology. Is this a, a direction you're going in? Or? Like your example with the fully house worker. Like yeah. I, it's probably like probably like a class of thing to like just blame sort of house workers for their conditions. Like yes, people don't want to work in an No. It's probably because of things like they were like institutionally locked out or things because like they're poor or things like that. Like <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Have to help poor people. Oh, I wouldn't blame them for their choice. Yeah. And I wasn't blaming them for the working conditions. in them conditions. I was saying that we are forcing them into these conditions, yeah. Right, yeah, it's different, yeah. yeah. Unemployed. Like, I think yeah. that's probably a better thing, like, even though an animal dies, in the trade-off between a poor person being employed and being able to feed their family and an animal dying, I would take the poor person being employed. Again. But we are, put, we are putting poor people in horrific conditions because we want to eat burgers. And I'd suggest that we could, we could uh, promote ethical products where they could get involved with that work. So, so we do have a different choice too, not just putting poor people in slaughterhouses so they can smell feces and blood we can say we want to support ethical products and they can work there. So we're putting, it's a human rights violation as well, which is what I suggested. To the extent that choice is probably really doesn't in a lot of countries, so the reality is that that person has to make that choice and like, it's not a good thing to make a value judgment on that person for like, something that they probably didn't have a lot of choice in. The value judgment wasn't on that person, it was on the consumer. It was saying, we are putting them in business. It is the, the blood is on the consumer's hands. Now, slaughterhouse workers, if they had another choice, would not want to work in these places, but it's, the, it's us, the consumers, that are giving them this choice. And it's a hard one for them to make. Some of them don't have a choice, you're right, which is my exact point. My exact point. Um, yeah. Um, are you coming in with a counter position here? Um, <laughs> I spent a lot of time in Asia last year, especially in rural areas of yeah. Thailand, and um, again, most of the food there is rice. Yeah. But they feel that they need it or they, they need it to survive uh, for some nutritional need? Well, all I'm going to say yeah. is I'm going to compare the places, the places where I went that had you know, more meat, you know, more access to yeah. the food than the places that didn't have meat. Um, the ones who had less meat, they were poorer? Which is more yeah. malnourished children. They were malnourished because they didn't have meat. They had less meat. They had oh, okay. access to things like rice, cabbage and meat. The, like, the yeah. I would say that having less meat is good for your health. I wouldn't suggest that it's bad. I'm, I'm just saying that the only things that are diet yeah. and Well, let's just say in the, in the West, we have these things, diseases, yeah. of, uh, dis diseases of affluence, okay? Diseases of affluence, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. In the poorer uh, rural areas of China, nearly non-existent. Rice, vegetables, their grains, sweet potatoes, things like this. Amazing, full of fiber, nutrients, cheaper. Yeah, I agree. I'm saying the people who live off these things and meat. I mean, those are the things in their diet. I'm talking rice, cabbage, and meat. Without meat, their diet is, is incomplete, lacking. is lacking. That's what I'm saying. I would, I would ask for evidence that um, a diet without meat is lacking in nutrients. I'm just saying. Because the, the science is on the opposite side of that plant based nutrition, plant based doctors. Uh, the plant-based eating movement's quite large now. There's pl plenty of peer-reviewed studies done by scientists who weren't vegan. So it's no, there's no bias there. Plant-based nutrition is becoming, it's much more superior. No saturated fat, cholesterol. Um. Okay, maybe, okay. If I yeah. said you have a choice between eating just rice or eating rice and meat, and then you have to make a choice between the lot of like... No, well, they have the choice of vegetables too. And rarely do you find, okay, I've only got the choice of rice and rice and meat. If they had rice and rice and meat, they'd need vitamin C because they'd get scurvy. So rice doesn't have vitamin C. Potatoes. You could live on potatoes just alone for a, for a year. My friend actually did. There's also problems with production in like farming and stuff. I mean, obviously, meat's a much more reliable product than crops. Yeah. Well, oh, I, I, mean, uh, I, 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 I don't, I don't know about that. This is a good avenue to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a whole range of, of issues. <laughs> good, good on you. <laughs> he's, he's, he's good there. I've uh, got someone up here who's had their hand up for ages. I am um, stung up. This is, is quite an emotive issue. Yeah. And what, what I saw there was, was quite. Emotional for me as well. 
Um, I feel like all of our arguments at the moment are exceptional circumstances, like on the, on the very edge of yeah. the discussion. My, my issue is that it seems like you're applying what I would call human standards to animals. <coughs> Um, I, can, I can tell that you feel about animals the same way I would feel about a child being slaughtered. What, what I'm seeing on that clip we've, we've just seen is atrocious and horrific. Yeah. And we've seen humans kicking piglets like that. So yeah. you can say that's human, a, a humane thing to be doing. Um, but then I've also been hunting and I've shot a deer and I've, yeah. I've like held it as it's bleeding out. Okay. And, um, uh, two very, very important things. I, I okay. think it's on a, on a scale. Is it scale? Uh, so, so I'm okay. trying to get someone to put forward uh, uh, this sort of uh, uh, I think I'm... Um, for a while, so, yeah. so, yeah. What's your name? What's your name, bro? Miles. Miles, Miles. Yeah. Um, you straw manned me there. You said, I, I, I suggest that killing an animal, uh, a pig in a slaughterhouse is the same as killing a baby. I would just say, does it, who has a dog here? No, I, I, I would say... Uh, who has a dog? Uh, who, raise your hands, who's got dogs? Do you have a dog, Miles? Okay, now let's just ex extend the respect and values you expect for your dog to the pigs here. Now, what would be the difference between your dog and a pig that justifies a gas chamber and a knife in the pig's throat and moral treatment for the dog? Now, whatever that justification is, let's think about it, is it intelligence? Now, science has shown pigs to be more intelligent. Okay, now what is it? They look different, or we've been taught that pigs are food and dogs are to be cared for. So, I would ask you that same question. What's the difference between a pig and a dog that justifies a knife in the pig's throat? I, I get a little bit wary when people start dropping logical fallacies because there is debate territory. Yeah. Um, I am just trying to understand where yeah. they're coming from. Because I agree entirely that yeah. what I've just seen is atrocious. Of course. Um, questions stemming from that would be is veganism the best option to make a change? Or can we get results from better legislation? Welfare, maybe? Who thinks it would be if the animals were treated better? Anyone for abolishing capitalism? <laughs> 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 Drummed out by McCarthy. <laughs> could, could that be the problem? Our economic system. I mean, yeah. might might but that can be the solution. Require a change of economic. That can be the solution too. Supply and demand. We can demand more ethical products, and that's Sorry, what I'll veganism is. All you out there. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Anyone think that better welfare would would make if if they were looked after a little bit better before they were pushed into a gas chamber? That would make it moral. Uh, well, well for in animal rights, welfare is, in, is just looking after the conditions of the animals before they are still, they're still essentially property. They're still essentially used and, and killed for their bodies. Then that's not what we're after. Yeah, see, that's, in animal rights, the word welfare has been kind of adulterated. And real welfare means looking after the welfare of an individual. Um, animal rights, welfare, means looking after the conditions. Free range eggs, baby chicks still get minced up alive. Free range chickens go to the same slaughterhouse as all the rest of the chickens. So that would be looking after their conditions, making them feel a little bit better before we slaughter them. That's our welfare and animal rights. It's not actually animal rights, it's animal welfare. I think we'll, we'll take a question there quickly. Um, so, uh, for example, um, I have a dog. Yeah. It's a tiny Pomeranian. Oh. So she can't hunt for her own food. So, um, because I am the one feeding my dog, do I, and if I choose to be vegan, yeah. would I have to subject my dog to veganism, which is not what dogs are naturally supposed to eat? Naturally? Dogs are not, na you're Pomeranian, does your dog exist in nature? Okay. Do you have a Pomeranian? Uh, right, this is a okay. question that I'd like to get to yeah. here, which is, um, you are looking at things that are basically, in a way, you could describe them as technology. Yeah. Their sole reason for existing. So that, that was domesticated. If we get rid of the process, then we'll end up getting rid of these animals one way or another. Yeah. Uh, are you looking for a natural die out? Do you want to see? I would. I, I honestly or? would love to see animal agriculture abolished completely. I think we have made freak shows out of these innocent beings. They're they're growing 
beyond their natural weight, their legs are broken because they can't support their own body weight. We can turn them into meat and milk machines for our own benefit. We've domesticated these animals. These animals don't exist in nature like that. This is a product of our breeding. On the dog topic, your, your dog doesn't exist in nature like that either. It's a dom they're domesticated animals. Um, if you chose to go vegan, the first step is for you to make uh, the ethical choice and to stop harming animals. Then, if you wanted to extend that to your companion animal, a dog, the fourth oldest living dog in the world was a plant-based dog. Okay, you can Google them. They were uh, Border Collie. Dogs are omnivore, omnivores, sorry, omnivores. They can eat both. Now, you can design a diet plant-based with adequate nutrition for dogs, and the science is there to... to uh, plenty of dogs. Now, I would ask you this, is it justified to kill 100 animals to um, feed one dog over the dog's life, lifetime when they can be healthy on formulated vegan pet food? But I'm not here to turn everyone's pets vegan. That's not what I'm suggesting, but... Um, I, the, we're we're going to get chucked out of here in a moment. It's a good so topic of discussion. Sure. Everyone's like, <laughs> they love it. You should keep it rolling. We're, we're gonna, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into trouble. Everyone's we'll very in, very intellectual crowd I, as well. I think, I, no, I'm, I'm sure yeah. you're open to talking to Definitely. people afterwards, are you? I've got cards as well if you want to yeah. have a chat afterwards. So, so we might move it outside. But yeah. for the moment, I want you to think about these key issues. And I'd, I'd like you to think further through the issue of animals as technology of whether that might allow for a, some form of human exceptionalism. But I'll leave that as a project for a few today. Thanks, so great work. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Change. It's time for us as a people to start making some changes. Let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. And let's change the way we treat each other. You see, the old way wasn't working, so it's on us to do what we got to do to survive. And still I see no changes